This show is sponsored by IdealWorkspace.com, which promotes a healthier way of working through their adjustable standing desk. Check out their latest smart adjustable standing desk at Altizen.com. A L T I Z E N.com. Welcome to Analyze Asia, the podcast dedicated to dissect the pulse of business, technology, and media in Asia. In this episode, I speak to Peruze Sabunku from Stripe to discuss the company's footprint in Asia and we also discuss how Stripe can help local startups to go global from their recent findings in the Singapore startup ecosystem. Hi Peruze. Hi Bernard. How are you doing? I'm pretty good, thanks. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for hosting me in the Stripe Singapore office. Of course, welcome. You just had an event yesterday, right? That's correct. Yes, and I'm talking to Peruzi Sabunchu, Head of Southeast Asia and Hong Kong for Stripe. Stripe is a very interesting company from Y Combinator, originated from Silicon Valley with two very interesting founders, but the conversation today is with you, Peruzi. So I want to get to know you better. How did you start your career? So right now, I'm from Turkey originally. I grew up in Turkey, I went to school in Turkey, then moved to US while I was in college. And I started my career, because my college was in Austin, UT Austin, I started my career at Dell, because Dell headquarters were there. I wasn't planning on a career in, in technology, but it turned out that it was something that I, I really enjoyed doing and, and really enjoyed the impact that the technology companies were making in the, in the world. Then I continued my education in Boston and worked on a startup idea where I could build something in the healthcare space uh, with technology. That company failed in two years, and I moved to uh, become a consultant uh, in San Francisco at McKinsey. And with McKinsey, I moved to Singapore. And while I was in Singapore, I started working at Stripe, and Stripe decided to come to Asia and Singapore and open up their offices. I became their first employee here. And actually, you're pretty well known with the startup community here because a lot of the startups a lot of developers use Stripe. So, I wanted to ask you a little bit on your career journey. What are the interesting lessons that you can share with my audience? I think one of the things that made this career fun for me, and luckily it turned out well <laughs> at the end, is I tried to really optimize for learning. Like, I'm a generally curious person. And then, like, combining learning with passion. And when I have those, like, also like adding that impact to it so when you when i combine those things i felt like a lot of the, the work stuff or learning about work hard work in, in a way became a fun thing for me and when you had all these years uh, all together turns out to be a fun journey and, and a lot of impact along the way how do you find asia as compared to where you come from which is more eurocentric and you have also worked in the u.s do you find that the cultural wise is pretty different? It is different, but I love it. I mean, I think if if I think of my last five years here, there is so much growth, so much change. And when you look at your west and east and north and south, like there are completely different cultures and audiences and consumers and technologies and infrastructure and they are all growing in different speed but they are growing so in a way it is a very very exciting market and like be, I think being in Singapore is exposing me to like from China to India to Southeast Asia a lot of different cultures and, and markets what I find very interesting is like as the American companies come to a certain stage they're also finding Southeast Asia very interesting because at the end if you look at the last five, six years, the region has been quite stable. The growth has been quite stable. If you look at the fundamentals, like how the population is growing, how the infrastructure is growing, these are all positive. And on top of it, there are a lot of like great stories. And so all of these things are making this place a very fun place to work in and contribute to. That's interesting, which also comes to the main subject of the day. I want to talk about the company Stripe in Southeast Asia, but we will talk a little bit about its impact within the Singapore startup ecosystem. So as a start, the thing I know is it's set up by two founders, a pair of twins, uh, John and Patrick Collision. If They're I'm brothers. Right. They're brothers. Two years apart. <laughs> yes. And can you introduce the company Stripe to my audience and what is the vision and mission of the company itself? 
absolutely. Stripe is like at Stripe. What we are trying to do is to build a unified infrastructure to start and scale businesses. Let's say online businesses and globally. At the core of our product is payments, but on top of it, we have a lot of different services and layers, like from services or tools that would help you build marketplaces, to manage fraud, to look into your data in a much detailed way, to to create beautiful checkout experiences. And I think a lot of services use Stripe to to do that. And what is your current role and coverage in Stripe? I am currently the the head of Southeast Asia and Hong Kong, so I'm responsible for growing Stripe's business in this region and also helping companies build better products and scale in Southeast Asia and Hong Kong. So, what is the current footprint of Stripe in Asia Pacific? I think you talk about Southeast Asia, you talk about Hong Kong. Are there other parts of Asia that they are also covering as well? Yeah, it, so Stripe is in. Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Singapore, and Hong Kong in Asia, and、uh, we have been in those countries for the last few years, and have been supporting many、uh, small size and bigger size companies. And also recently, it has a partnership with Alipay and Tenpay in China as well. That's correct. This is something that I'm very excited about. Actually, what this means is any company that is on Stripe platform. Would be able to accept Alipay and WeChat Pay, and be able to access the hundreds of millions of Chinese consumers.、Mm, considering that、uh, the Chinese internet companies are now entering into Southeast Asia in a really big way with these payment services, so it's probably interesting to talk about your users. Who are some of your customers, and how does one on board with Stripe? I mean, as a As an owner of a media platform myself, like Analyze Asia, I'm actually using going to be putting Stripe as my for my subscription plan system. So, how, how who are your customers? Um, sure. We have various types of or sizes of customers. Actually, we work with a lot of、uh, technology-first platforms and companies that people in Singapore and the region are using、uh, in their day-to-day lives, from Deliveroo to Grab to Honesty to Kickstarter. And these companies are using us in various different ways. They, they can be accepting payments, managing marketplaces. Or, or or having subscriptions. The the other types of companies are actually the the startups, the the companies that get funded, that get built in Singapore. Currently, around two thirds of the top funded startups in Singapore are on Stripe, are using Stripe. And then the other one is there are a lot of small businesses、uh, or or even medium sized businesses that use some of the web platforms and tools to set up their websites. Like、Shopify, Squarespace, etc., and they also use Stripe to accept payments. And for those companies, actually starting on Stripe is very easy because there is a accept payments with Stripe button. You click on it. There is an online form. It takes about five to six minutes to to fill it in, and you're ready to accept payments in 135 currencies. If you are a、um, you know a, a developer who want to build a small site and create a great、uh, checkout experience. It can take two to three hours to to build with Stripe APIs, and you're done. Pretty simple because,、uh, like for example, my wife runs an e-commerce site. She uses Stripe as a payment system using WordPress, similar、mm-hmm. to what I'm also doing. So, what are the products and services which Stripe offer to merchants and developers? Let's give an example, right? Let's say that you are a developer and you want to test out. Uh, you have a product. You want to test out what markets would use it, and like if there is any demand for your product. You can start with basic payment processing, and then let's say that you find out that like China can be an interesting market for you. You can turn on Alipay and WeChat Pay and have access to Chinese consumers, and then you find out that like, actually like marketplace can be a a good model for your product, and you can accept payments and then pay. Out to your your merchants or the companies that you are bringing to your platform, and then if you want to charge them monthly, you can also build subscription solutions on top of your solution. And the the best part is, on top of it, like you can use like the Stripe machine learning, like the radar tool, or or our Sigma tool, and like get very much into your data and understand 
or where the users are coming from, like uh, where your business is going, and like get get, get very much a, a lot of analytics out of the data sets you have. I, I guess a lot of people underappreciate the infrastructure that Stripe actually provides to the these developers, right? Because things like fraud detection, things like analytics to allow them to put in, and for example, AI to, or go multi-currency is not uh, something very simple. If you want to use some other payment provider, you have to fill out form in each different country as well. So the, the ability to allow them to access different markets is something that is underappreciated. Let's say if I'm a merchant, I guess this is to follow up with that question. If I'm a merchant, if I have run a lot of digital payments, then what does Stripe actually offer to them then? If you're a merchant and if you have a lot of online payments, one of the things that you can do with Stripe is like really optimize your checkout flow and user experience because you have a lot of data. And the other thing you can do is really improve like not only your front end and the customer experience, but also back end. Uh, one of the one of the things that we are we are excited about is like how we are enabling companies to grow and scale without adding a lot of people at the back end to manage reconciliation and reporting. And I think the other thing to add to that is like because, as you might know, there are so many other tools and services that we are working with and that we are connected to. Many of your other, like the say, CRM tools or accounting tools or tax tools, can be connected to Stripe. And Stripe can be, in a way, your backbone as you are building your your company. So Stripe has celebrated your one year anniversary in Singapore, and I guess one of the major announcements was something to do with startups. So I wanted to first ask you what are some of the milestones you have achieved, and then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that startups are doing here. Yeah, it's been a year since we officially launched in Singapore. Uh, really exciting times for us. As I mentioned, we were able to work with a lot of bigger and smaller size companies and learn from them and like, with their feedback, launch a lot of the products that I mentioned, like from our marketplace products to our, our analytics products. What I'm really proud of is we not only enabled some of the global companies that came to Singapore, but we also started working with companies and organizations like GovTech, like powering their parking lot app or Capital Land or, or Honest Bee. These are great experiences for us and we are really excited to be powering some of these Singaporean companies and, and organizations. So this comes to this interesting question, right? How are startups within the region? I mean, for example, Singapore could go global from day one then. Absolutely. As you might know, Singaporean entrepreneurs and Singaporean companies need to be much more globally minded compared to entrepreneurs from other countries because of the sheer size of the, the country that or the market uh, that they have. Uh, and then let's add to that the, the proximity to a lot of like interesting big consumer markets. Like let's add to that the English being the, the main language here. Now on top of this, what is happening is a lot of tools like Stripe, AWS, etc. are coming to Singapore and giving them the, the tools that any like world-class entrepreneur or developer would, would have. And what is happening is like with this ability to scale, they are able to start and go global from day one. So one interesting part of it is that you also announced a new research to celebrate an anniversary called the Startups Fact. So what are the key findings? And one thing I'm, I'm super curious, you mentioned AWS, there is also different technology tools that actually power this new wave of entrepreneurship. And what do you see are the ones that are interesting to entrepreneurs? Sure. With the survey we conducted this year, some of the some of our partners in Singapore, what we wanted to find out was like it is clear that the Singaporean startup ecosystem is growing. And we wanted to understand the factors that were contributing into that. One of the biggest findings we found was like how globally minded the startups in Singapore are. Sixty uh, percent of the startups that we surveyed are already selling globally. When we looked at the startups that got founded a year ago, close to 40% of them were selling globally. And when we looked at the ones that aren't selling globally and asked them a follow-up question, close to 50% of them were thinking of going to another market outside of Singapore. Uh, the second very interesting finding was when we asked them 
uh, this question, they said more than 60% said uh, they couldn't have launched their startup as little as five years ago in Singapore. And the follow-up question would be the technology tools, right? Is it because now you have something like AWS, something like Salesforce or CRM? What are the kind of tools that people are now powering this new wave of entrepreneurship? Yeah. So just to follow up, like when we ask the why is it the case and what, what has changed? One of the main reasons is actually the, what the startups are saying is like 25% of the startups said that the ability to outsource their non-core activities and the ability to focus on the value that they would add and that their core businesses help them be successful and scale much faster. And yes, they are using a lot of those tools in Singapore currently. Actually, companies that we surveyed use more six or more of these tools to run their day-to-day business. And about 160 tools, these are cloud-based software tools that you pay as you grow, were mentioned. What are these tools? A lot of the common names came, like AWS, Google Cloud, Google Analytics, Trello, Slack, Stripe and payments. Yeah, I kind of get the same stack as well around that, maybe with Asana. I'm specifically interested in one product in Stripe, but Stripe Atlas. Mm-hmm. I think it's a pretty interesting product because I, for one, if I would have done my startup today, I would have gone on Stripe Atlas immediately. So I want you to sort of tell my audience a little bit about Stripe Atlas and can Asian startups tap on Stripe Atlas and how do they go about doing that? So Stripe Atlas is enabling any startup from around the world to set up a company, to set up a bank account, to get some lawyer and accountant services in, in one package without leaving their countries. And actually, the form to fill out is, like, I think it takes about 15, 20 minutes, and that's, that's pretty much it. And it's in the U.S. market, right? This is for the U.S. market. It is a, uh, it's a Delaware-based uh, C-Corp. And you might ask, why do companies do this? And like, why, why is there a demand? Some companies want to have access to the tools that Singaporean or American entrepreneurs have. And in their countries, they don't have access to those tools. Some companies need to go to that market immediately. And having a company in that market very, very beneficial for them. But some companies came to a certain scale that they need access to funding in the US. That's right. And <laughs> they might have a higher chance of getting that funding if they have a, a C Corp uh, in the US. Specifically for Asia, do you actually need to customize some of your products from Stripe for the local markets? Or is it really universal that you know, the payment infrastructure is just the same everywhere? We will just make sure that all the local pipes are actually connected to your payment infrastructure. There are certain things that are universal, but of course, before we come into a country, there are certain sets of localization that we have to do so that we can provide the best experience to the local entrepreneurs and consumers. As you know, we are able to get a Singaporean business online immediately. And of course, the Singaporean databases and then the, the, the banking infrastructure is different. So we need to be connected in a different way so that these Singaporean businesses can get online immediately. So yes, there is, there is some localization, but we believe that from the developer tool perspective, any entrepreneur and developer around the world would deserve the, the best standards and we want to keep our API as universal as possible. I want to take the conversation a bit out into where you actually cover, for example, Southeast Asia and Hong Kong. I I think there is a lot of conversation recently in Singapore about cashless society. I I guess my question is, where do you see are the key challenges in Southeast Asia and Hong Kong with relations to digital payments? Is it because uh, people are still very used to cash, or do you see that there's moving? It's, it's actually a, that an idea has really come to a point that actually these societies are going to go cashless because of the influence of China, because China is totally cashless these days. I don't know what influence will change those societies, but what I believe change people's behaviors is dominant use cases coming into their lives. If you think of what you do for transportation now and how things change in the last four or five years in Singapore and how you get, get used to using companies like Grab and Uber, it's, it's a big shift. And now you're much more comfortable with putting your credit card on a tool and not even thinking of like 
what you're paying and how you are paying. So I think the way to change the behavior and move to a cashless society will come from companies building interesting and relevant services for, to, for the consumers and consumers' behavior changing eventually. And I think the challenges in different societies will be different. Being in Hong Kong, where the banking infrastructure is much stronger and everyone has a bank account and a credit card, it might be much easier to change the behavior compared to some of the Southeast Asian countries where there is a higher bankless population. Where do you see the role of Stripe in this cashless society world? The amount of cashless systems being used or the e-commerce percentage of the, of the society. So I believe around 5% of retail is right now online. There is so much more room to grow and we think that by giving the entrepreneurs and developers more tools and making it easier to buy and sell online, we are going to contribute in some way to cashless society. Yeah, and I think this is probably will be a continuing story for Stripe moving forward in a region that is now really trying to move towards digital payments and cashless in a big way. Many thanks for coming on the show, and of course, it comes to the closing. I, I have decided these days to ask my guests, can you recommend something that you have read, seen, or heard recently that's interesting in your line of work that's relevant or relevant to my audience? Um... I listen to your podcast and uh, some of my friends are listening to them and one of my favorite new podcasts is uh, Rough Translations. I don't know if you've heard of it. Uh, it came out of NPR and what it does is it looks at some of the, the concepts that are commonly talked about. It can be racism or it can be like many other things that are uh, top of mind in, in popular culture and it looks at different stories around the world and give some examples like the latest one was fake news in Ukraine. Really fun and great weekend listening. I highly recommend it. Mm. And I will just drop in a recommendation for a podcast that I've recently started listening in. Uh, actually it's by Ezra Klein, Sarah Cliff and uh, Meg Lasis from Fox called Beats. And what I actually like about that podcast is that it talks about public policy with uh, social economic theories and actually think about how people make decisions and how people formulate certain uh, policies. So, now, my last question, and always everybody wants to know, how can my audience find you? You can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Piruza Sabunju, or I am Piruza on Twitter. Mm. And I definitely put that in the show notes. You can find me at bernardleong.com, and yes, my Twitter handle is now Bernard Leon. After holding that handle for the longest time, I've decided to change it. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Acast, and Google Play in the US market. You can tweet to me on your feedback, recommend us with a star on Overcast, and of course, send me your valuable feedback. So once again, Peruzi, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, Bernard.